Hello and welcome to the hot seat with Violet Gonda, the program that puts the newsmakers in the spotlight to deal with the tough issues relating to Zimbabwe. So who's in the hot seat this week? Welcome to Hot Seat with Violet Gonda. My guest today is a former finance minister and uh, opposition leader, Sendai Biti. In this first segment, the focus is on Zimbabwe's economic crisis. How bad is the crisis that has seen goats now being used as legal tender in some parts of the country? What did Mr. Biti uh, learn about how state finances are run and if he was still in charge of the Treasury, what would he have done differently to avoid the bond notes? These and more questions covered on this episode of Hot Seat. Welcome, Mr. Beatty. Uh, thank you, Violet. Let's start with this whole issue of the economic crisis. How bad is it, really? Well, it's, it's a scandalously hopeless. It's scandalously terrible. Th- these guys have failed and, and Patrick Namasa has failed. I call it uh, voodoo economics uh, being practiced by these Zanu zombies and Chinamasa is the chief, the chief zombie. The biggest challenge that they have is that the economy is not uh, producing. Uh, output has collapsed and collapsed uh, completely. Uh, aggregate demand has collapsed and collapsed uh, completely. Capacity utilization has collapsed and collapsed completely. So we are in a recession. Since 2018, the economy has been on a downward spiral, and this recession is fast-tracking itself to an economic depression. Remember, this is an economy that is very cyclical. This is an economy that moves from slumps and booms, but its slumps tend to be elongated. Remember, the crisis last time from 1997 to 2008 lasted for 11 years. So I think we're in the middle of another elongated uh, depression which unless corrective measures, decisive measures are taken, we could be stuck in this rut for another 11 to 16 years. What does the absence of a local uh, currency actually mean to the grassroots? I remember the Zimbabwean public rejected the Zim dollar. A currency at the end of the day functions on confidence, functions on trust. So if the citizen stops to believe in its currency, then you have a problem. In Zimbabwe, one of the key things that has collapsed is confidence. We have lost confidence in this regime. We have lost the trust in this regime. All societies function on trust, uh, what philosophers call the social contract. In Zimbabwe, the social contract is broken. And when trust uh, collapses, societies such as Zimbabwe, where there is no trust, become low trust, high cost societies. And societies that are functional are high trust low-cost societies. So coming to the issue of a currency specifically, Zimbabweans have got long memories. They remember how the Zimbabwean dollar was an instrument of arbitration, of arbitrage. Zimbabweans know how the Zimbabwean dollar and hyperinflation stole away their, their wealth. Pension years up to date have not recovered. Asset managers up to date have not recovered. Company balance sheets up to date have not recovered because of the Zimbabwean dollar. What Zimbabweans knew, want is a stable economy. And before we can even think of retaining the Zimbabwean dollar, let's produce, let's export, let's build foreign currency reserves of over US $5 billion. And to me, the Zimbabwean dollar is gone. It will never come back. There is no country in the world which is dollarized and which has managed to demonetize the Zimbabwean dollar because it's confidence. The Zimbabwean dollar was caught in flagranto by the people of Zimbabwe. And you and I know what happens when someone is caught in, in flagranto. Trust is, is gone and the divorce has to, has, to, has to happen. It's really sad to hear that our own currency will, will, will never return. But we'll come back to that issue of the, of the cash crisis. Let's just go back a bit to help us understand a bit more of um, the situation. What did you see in the GNU as finance minister? What were you able to uncover? Well, the, the most important thing in running an economy and to running a government, running an organization, is trust. The secret to good economics is to live within one's means. And I popularized the phrase, you eat what we, you kill. So we ran a, a, a regime of austerity. We didn't have money anyway. When I started in February of 2009, there was $4 million in the, in the, in the, in the, in the bank. And in the entire 
in the in the government tre- in treasury and in the entire uh, the entire broad money supply circulating in the country was a mere 250 million US dollars by the end of the year we built that to 2.2 billion dollars so the first thing is live within your means eat what you kill so we ran a strict regime of cash budgeting we had a budget office in respect of which we all set officials set and approved the priority of uh, priorities. We did, not, we did not borrow and we did not spend what we don't have. The problem with ZANU-PF is that it suffers from a disease called fiscalitis, which is the fictitious belief that they think money grows on trees. As I'm talking to you right now, the, the, the budget deficit as a percentage of GDP is over, is over 43%. Domestic debt as a percentage of GDP, GDP is, over, is over 60%. So it's absolutely ridiculous. They can't run the economy. There is no fiscal discipline. The second thing is that you have to create conditions for those that create wealth to create wealth. An economy doesn't run on controls. An economy doesn't run on structural instruments. An economy doesn't run on dirigism. You control everything. So we've got excessive taxes. We've got import restrictions. We've got such an instrument 64 of 2016. Capital can't breathe. And if capital can't breathe, capital will not produce. Thirdly, we need to attract foreign direct investment in this uh, country. We can only attract foreign direct investment if we are competitive. We are not uh, competitive. Our costs are too high. Look at the cost of our electricity. Look at the premium put by corruption in this country because every businessman who, comes, who wants to invest in Zimbabwe, there's a ZANU-PF minister who wants a huge cut from him. So capital is fickle. It will go to other, uh, other, other places. Uh, look at the, the but, corrosive but, effect of the Mr. Indigenization Mr. Empowerment Mr. Act. We'll invest me... $300 million when you are going to part with 51% of that. It doesn't make sense. So the long and short of it is that ZANU on their own can never run this economy. And it has been proved in the last four years that Chinamasa has been doddling around as a Minister of Finance. When you were a Minister of Finance, um, when you were in government, billions of uh, uh, dollars left the country or the, uh, left the government. Can we unpack this issue of corruption that you mentioned briefly? Um, what did you actually see? What, and what terrible decisions did you have to make on this issue? Government receives money from taxes. So the most important organ in, from a revenue collection point of view is the Zimbabwe Revenue Authority. So we didn't get a lot of money. In the first year, we had uh, uh, 900 uh, uh, million U.S. dollars. In the second year, the budget was 2 billion U.S. dollars. In the third year, we tried to make it to, to 4 billion U.S. dollars. So money that is stolen in Zimbabwe is not being stolen from Treasury. Treasury has got strict rules and treasury is subject to parliamentary oversight. People steal money from parallel government operations, and ZANU deliberately ran parallel government operations, as they are still doing today. The biggest parallel uh, government operation were diamonds in Chiazwa, where ZANU placed Obet Mpofu, that grand thief, to basically uh, circumvent a, a, a diamond revenue coming to treasury. And you and I know Mugabe has admitted 15 billion US dollars left the country. The parallel government was in the form of uh, huge, huge uh, parallel resources that were ought to have gone to the consolidated revenue fund that were not ca- accounted for. This included the money that Tobayom did collects from passports, death certificates, and debt certificates. This includes the huge millions and millions of dollars that Augustine Chuhuri collects through uh, penalties and fines from the Zimbabwe uh, Republic Police. This includes huge fees that are collected from organs like EMA and and national parks. This includes millions and millions of dollars that are co- collected by potras. This includes millions and millions of dollars in targets that are collected by, by Zinara, for instance. So ZANU deliberately ran a part of government to deny a treasury a money and in the process to find their nefarious a patronage system which has kept them in power for the last 37 years. But there, there seems to be no limits, um, you know, based on what you're saying, to how much uh, people were taking out of the country. If you also look at what you mentioned, that the president himself admitted that $15 billion left the country. 
Um, yeah. Looking back, the, the, do you, yeah, do you yeah, wish yeah, that you had some exchange control? Looking back, when you're finance minister, do, do you do, do you wish that you had had some exchange control, for example? Exchange controls were always always there. Uh, you you cannot move money in Zimbabwe without approval of the Reserve Bank. So capital accounts is 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 a, is a, are there. Let me let me. I know where you are coming from. The first thing we did was we had to liberalize the capital account. As I said, when I started, there was a mere two hundred fifty million dollars in the in the in the in the in the system in the form of broad money supply. In order to attract the capital, capital in the form of foreign direct investments, capital in the form of diaspora remittances, capital in the form of overseas development assistance, we had to say anyone who wants to bring money, you can bring money because you can take it out. That's why by the end of 2009, 2.5 billion, sorry, 2.2 billion dollars were in the system. By the time I left in 2013, there was 5.5 billion US dollars in the system. We could only attract that because we allowed the capital account to be functional. So what has caused the shortage is not that people are taking out money. Remember, when you are taking out money, you are taking your money. You are not taking another person's money, which is a myth uh, that ZANU-PF uh, has. Separate the issue of illicit financial flows. Illicit financial flows never get into the system. And the private sector is the number one perpetrator of illicit financial flows. So if you take platinum, for instance, when tons and tons of platinum met metals is shipped out of Zimbabwe, there are about 10 deriv derivatives, including para para palladium, for instance. That is not fully accounted for uh, to, 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 to Zimbabwe. So there's what is called transfer uh, pricing, there's what is called uh, thin capitalization, and these are things that are hitting Zimbabwe. This is, this is the, uh, uh, what is known as illicit financial flows. On the African continent, almost a yearly, more than a trillion dollars is leaving the African continent. And in fact, ironically, more money is leaving the African continent in true illicit financial flows than money that is coming to Africa in the form of aid. So this is a different debate uh, to the narrow question of liberalizing or not the capital account. What did you learn about the political executive and their traveling habits with money? Well, the, 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 it, well I used to... I used to Expose it in my budget. It, it used to say to me that uh, the traveling budget was always more than what we put to education. And there was one man who used to travel more than anyone else, and that was uh, uh, President uh, Robert Mugabe. In one year, we spent 28 million US dollars on travel alone, and we spent on education other than salaries, we spent 9 million US dollars, and that was criminal. And in my time, they would make requests of two million, three million, and I would just cut that uh, the traveling expense. I know that after I've left, the tips are open. He goes away with four million dollars, with six million US dollars. And part of the problem is not Robert Mugabe per se. Part of the problem is the entourage around him, which makes a killing when they travel with him because their pay diems increase. So, so, so they deliberately create these trips. They deliberately make him a permanent resident of the skies in order to loot uh, Zimbabwe. So it's the bureaucracy around him which is also uh, capable. But, but you know, in other countries, the issue of pediam that is given to head of state it must be returned when he comes. But one of the criminal things in Zimbabwe is that he takes four million dollars, he doesn't bring it. So it's it's really criminal that uh, we have schools that have no lights in Zimbabwe. We have schools that where students are in and people are sharing classrooms with animals, yet a single presidential trip can cover uh, more than uh, 10 schools. It's criminal and unacceptable. But Mr. Beatty, was the president's budget ever audited? If you say you will take at least $4 million per trip, was it ever audited the, to, to find out what the, the money was being spent on? The budget of the, of the OPC is never, is never audited. And thanks to British Westminster traditions, Remember, the, the Prime Minister uh, uh, was the executive, and under the Prime Minister, the intelligence operated, the, the CIO, just like M5 operates in the UK. And the false notion is that you don't audit uh, anything that the intelligence has. And this is criminal. So the, the, the office of the OPC basically runs a slush fund 
to oppress and repress the people of Zimbabwe and also to loot. And I find this is unacceptable. And I think that one of the unfinished business of constitutional reform is to revisit chapter 5 of our constitution, the chapter that deals with the, the creation of the imperial executive president, which we created. That institution must be liquidated. If we are going to have a president elected by parliament as the South Africans do, so be it. If we are going to resort to a Westminster prime ministerial uh, matrix, so be it. But a modern state like Zimbabwe, which has been abused by power, cannot allow uh, for all intents and purposes, the reproduction of an imperial president such as the one codified in Chapter 5 of our Constitution. If the president was spending uh, at least $4 million per trip, uh, um, uh, the, the, the prime minister was also accused of globe trotting. How much was he spending and was his budget audited? That, the, the $4 million didn't happen under my watch, uh, Violet. That's happening now. That's, that's happening now. That, that, that didn't happen under my watch. We would do rem- restrict... Uh, uh, you know, you know, a trip to about 1.2 million, and much of that was actually about 700,000 would actually go to the chat, uh, the the charter fees uh, for Air Zimbabwe. So that didn't happen under my watch. It's happening now. The party is now. Santa Claus is back in town, thanks to Patrick Namasa and Zanu Pierce. But while you were in government, um, you did warn the president, and indeed you also warned uh, cabinet about. Um, senior government officials overspending on these um, uh, foreign trips. What was the response from, from the cabinet? Uh, we, 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 what we did was, and we, we, we were very strict, what we did was in every budget we put an amount for travel. And once the ministry exhausted that, that was the end of it. If you are going to go outside Zimbabwe, you had to be, you know, whoever was inviting you had to pay for your trip. And that, that, that worked, that worked, you know. But part of the problem was that for any minister to travel, he has to get cabinet approval. In other words, the president has to approve. So you would have a situation where ministers would then get cabinet approvals. They would come to treasury and would say, look, my friend, you exhausted your money. The, the other ministers knew we were tough, so we didn't have a fight. The one office which we had a problem with was, of course, the office of the OPC, because the president thought he had an entitlement to travel wherever he, he pleased. And, of course, there were constant fights during my four-and-a-half-year tenure in government. I understand that he also had, um, this is the president, um, he's got an overdraft facility with the CBZ. As finance minister, did you know how much the president's overdraft was and uh, who covers it? No, I didn't know that. I mean, remember the relations between, the CBZ is a commercial bank, so its relations with its customers are a matter of privilege. I had no idea about that, and in any event, uh, if he runs a personal account, it's a personal account. I had no idea about uh, about that. What I can tell you is that uh, we were concerned about the levels of non-performing loans uh, in the banking system, which at a certain stage were over 30%. So we put measures to ensure that uh, non-performing loans were, 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 were reduced as to which, which characters banks were, were lending to, I had no idea. But what I can tell you is that uh, before the land reform program in, in 1999-2000, 74% of bank lending was actually going to the farming sector. And the biggest departments in every bank were agribusiness uh, departments. With the collapse of land as collateral following the land reform program, it's said that Seven years after independence, the biggest borrower from the banks are actually individuals. And of course, when individuals borrow, you and I know that it's not for production. It's for buying flat screen televisions, buying Mercedes Benz, and our economy is dead because banks don't have uh, attractive banking assets where they can lend to. And if banks can lend, it means there is no regeneration of capital. It means that there are no startup. It means there's no new business. And you compound that with the challenge of absence of foreign direct investment, you have what you, the current situation which you have right now, which is zero, which is deflation, which is a stagnation, which is inertia, which is indifference, which is like a dizziness. So uh, coming back to the issue of uh, the cash crisis, uh, do you regret uh, choosing the U.S. dollar and not the, the RAND, for example, um, since South Africa is Zimbabwe's largest trading partner? Look, again, I know where you are coming from. That question can't arise because we adopted both the RAND and the U.S. dollars. We adopted a regime of multiple uh, currencies. The, the, it was the market which determined which 
currency it preferred. And of course, the, the predominant uh, mode of exchange is the U.S. dollars. Even in South Africa itself, despite the fact that they use the rand, they want our uh, uh, importers to pay using the U.S. dollar because the U.S. dollar is more, uh, 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 is more steady and the rand is uh, volatile. So it was not government. It was not government. It was not the Minister of Finance which determined the preference of a currency. And remember... If you go to my statement of the 17th of March 2009, when I introduced this step and I revised the, the budget, I made it clear that the current of reference was actually the, 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 the rand. But to answer your next question, which you haven't asked, it doesn't matter whether we use the rand or the U.S. dollar or the Chinese renminbi or the Nigerian naira. Unless we have the basics right, we'll just bastardize. That currency, the way we've bastardized the Zim dollar, the way we've bastardized the Bera check, the way we've bastardized the U.S. dollar, the way we've bastardized the bond note, we have to get the fundamentals right. And fundamentals are three things. Number one, we have to produce. Because when we produce, we sell to other countries. And when we sell to other countries, we accumulate uh, uh, reserves. Right now, we've got one week of import cover, which are SDRs, special drawing rights, that I left which are in, 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 in Washington, D.C., at the IMF in Pennsylvania uh, Avenue. We have no reserves. We have to build reserves. Number two, we have to manage the economy well. If the government is bloated and spends too much money, it will overborrow. And when it overborrow, that will put pressure uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, on, on the on the currency. Uh, so those okay. are the things that we have to do. And unless we attend to those a fundamentals, it doesn't matter which currency you can bring. But Mr. BG, is some economists will actually disagree with that because they will say, yes, the rand was used, uh, especially in Blauer, but the preferred currency was actually the, the, the dollar. And um, this made it easier for corrupt elements to smuggle the U.S. dollar out of the country. Uh, you know, as the, 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 the rand would have been much, much harder to smuggle out of the country. Is this, why? Is this why? Is not a, a, why? An international why? currency. Why? Because it's not why? an international currency. Oh, because it's not the rand is an international currency. currency. The rand is an international. Who says the rand is not an international currency? As, These as, are fictitious arguments. The US These dollar. are fictitious arguments that are being used by people who have failed. The problem we have right now, the cash shortages, is not a, the result of the currents which we are using. The problem which we are having, the people, why people are sleeping in banks is because Shinamasa has stolen money at the central bank. The, reprob- the government is maintaining an overdraft facility at the central bank. Since 2014, they've been stealing money at the central bank, but the central bank doesn't have money to broke. So, in fact, they've been stealing money in people's RTGS balances. They've been stealing money in people's nostril accounts. So, when you go and take your money, you won't find it. So, assuming the theory is correct that people are externalizing, people are externalizing what is theirs. So, if I've got $100 and go to, to my bank eh, 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 and get $100, that shouldn't affect you, Vi, when you go to your bank and ask for $100. But if another person has come and raided your money and my money, then we will have a problem. And this is what happened. There's been a bank robber, a modern Josie Wells, a modern outlaw in the form of the of Chinamasa, who has gone and raided the central bank to fund a, a, a excessive government expenditure, to fund excessive a, a recurrent expenditure. And that is the problem. The, the, the issue of people getting money should have happened under my watch. We should have, if, if, because people will always externalize. Why didn't they externalize between 2009 and 2013? Money was still fungible. The rand is fungible. The rand is an international currency. Uh, looking at the economy now in terms of the bond notes and the banks failing to service people, if you were the finance minister, how would you advise the government, and indeed the Reserve Bank Governor, Dr. Mangujiga, what is the alternative? How, how can they get out of this? Firstly, they have to understand that it's not a monetary issue. So the challenge is not with John Mangundra at all. It's a fiscal issue. It's a government issue. It's a treasury issue. So number one, government must put into place conditions where companies are resuscitated, where companies can start producing again, where industry reopens. There's no substitute for that. 
And if it means that we have to go to the Afro Exim Bank, if it means that we have to go to the IFC, if it means that we have to go to the African Development Bank to get at least, at least a billion US dollars, which we will put into Zim, ZIMAF and ZREF to resuscitate our companies, we have to do that. That's number one. Number two, government itself has to be small. The problem is that we've got this monstrous, huge monster called the government, which is leaning on a tiny little productive sector. So there has to be reform. We have to reform the public uh, uh, you know, wage sector. When I was Minister of Finance, there were 236,000 public servants. Now ZANU-PF is employed, and there are now 550,000 ghost workers. Those ghost workers have to go so that the genuine civil servant has to go. We have to trim government. Another form of reform, we have to get rid of these parastate house, which we are only using to create jobs for our sons-in-law. Air Zimbabwe must go and a host of other parastate house that are... A, a, a vehicle of patronage, patronage and arbitrage in our economy. Number three, we have to come up with a new Diamond Act because there is a mess in the diamond sector. We have to come up with a new Mines and Minerals Act because there's a mess in our, in our Mines Act. Number five, we have to repeal the Indigenous Age and Empowerment Act so that we can bring in foreign direct investment. So, so these are structural reforms. Number, number six, we have to deal with our debt. This country has got a sovereign debt of over 10 billion US dollars, and that debt is putting a premium on our country. So we have to, we have to have a, a, a debt cancellation, a genuine debt cancellation program with the World Bank, with the IMF. So these are few of the things we have to do. But the biggest, the biggest premium on our economy, the biggest sanction on our economy is ZANU PF. So everything I'm saying at is technical. The real elephant in the living room is ZANU PF. The real solution to this country. Moving forward, the real solution to finding a sustainable solution is how we deal with the creature called ZANU-PF. So ultimately, the question is not even about the fiscal discipline. Ultimately, the question is how do we deal with the creature and monster called ZANU-PF. It therefore becomes political, not economical. Well, that is the million-dollar question, and I hope um, you, we will be able to continue with this conversation next week where we will talk about um, the political uh, situation in the country, the state of the opposition, and uh, issues of the coalitions as political parties start preparing for elections next year. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Tendai BT, for talking to us on the program. You've been listening to the program Hot Seat with Violet Gonda.